Greetings and welcome to Engineering and Society, a monthly podcast about engineering and society, or engineering in society, or engineering and society. Yes, in this podcast, we have conversations about how engineering and engineers shape the world we live in and how society is shaping engineering. So every month, what Hassan and I are going to do is we're going to scan the news for contentious issues or contentious reports about grand challenges in engineering, such as engineering better medicines or renewable energy or some new infrastructure development or adoption of self-driving cars. All of this from the point of view of the role of engineers and what that means. It means we'll talk straight from the heart about things that matter about the world we live in, to each other and with our guests who are engineering change. I am Dr. Hassan Rashidi. And I am Dr. Claire Nelson, and we are Engineering Society. So Hassan, yeah, let's begin today by talking about healthcare engineering or engineering in healthcare or in the grand challenges parlance, they would say engineering better medicines and health informatics, which are part of the grand engineering challenges. Now, it's interesting that, you know, we're launching this just around a time when the UN is celebrating UN Health and Safety Day. At the same time, World Health Day was also the month of April. But more importantly, we are going through a major global crisis. So I want you to think about the engineering construct, right? And if you think about the broad picture, what are you, let us begin by me asking this question. What are you seeing in terms of healthcare engineering or healthcare and engineering that gives you hope? Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting question. So, uh, you know, when I look at this situation that uh, we have uh, a lot of people, you know, involved with this, with this condition uh, across the globe, um, despite uh, all of the great work and great things that medical, profession, pro- medical professionals are doing, uh, the medical system and healthcare system uh, is not effective and efficient at all actually that's 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 almost the opposite so uh, and the reason is because you know it is it is not engineered the way it should be and i think engineering will help that a lot so let me talk about that a little in more details for example when you apply engineering solutions and design solution to a system generally looking at engineering uh, approaches we have a engineering triangle of quality cost and schedule so we always try to increase the quality of the system reduce the cost and optimize the schedule but when we look at the medical and healthcare system and it's actually the opposite the quality is not high the quality is low the cost is is very high and the schedule is almost terrible but you're depressing me you're supposed to be giving me hope what gives me hope we will get there in a minute <laughs> so, so this is this is the situation now okay but, but the good news is i think the future of health and medical system is going to be more and more based on advances and innovations in engineering and technology. And uh, when we apply engineering and technology to this system, it will make it more effective and efficient. Okay. So with that, we have, for example, advanced and emerging technologies such as nanotechnology, additive manufacturing known as 3D printing, Mm -hmm. biotechnology, automation and robotic technology, Uh neurotechnology, artificial intelligence and machine learning are going to dramatically change uh, human health and improve the quality of life. And I think that that's a trend that I am seeing. Well, okay, so nanotechnology, 
3D printing, AI and robots. I think you said one more, I can't remember right now. But I want to look at where we are today and stop because you know we're seeing all these companies coming out with you know ventilating machines, for example. That's an engineered system. So how would robots, let's say, and 3D printing help? Let's just take a very specific thing like the whole ventilating machinery ecosystem, if such a thing exists. Yeah, for example, in, in case of, in case of um, uh, ventilators, that uh -huh. is one of the most important medical equipment needed today. Uh -huh. Actually, uh, additive manufacturing or 3D printing is, is very promising. For example, okay. there, are, there are a lot of hospitals that they have ventilators, but they cannot use it because they need to, for example, replace uh, oxygen valves and they don't have those oxygen valves. And then another thing is this condition itself already damaged the supply chain system globally. So the suppliers cannot send those valves to the hospitals and you know, care centers to, to be used. But what, what engineers have done recently, they use 3D printing actually to, to, 3D, to manufacture those valves mm -hmm. and get the medical equip equip equipment running. And I think engineers are very innovative. They are very creative. They come up with different ideas, good designs, and they are doing it. So, As a matter of fact, I heard also that in Africa, in West Africa, a group of youngsters were 3D printing, um, using 3D printing to do some ventilating parts. And also in Jamaica, where I'm from, some youngsters were using 3D printing to print face shields because there was no masks, you know. So, so, so you're right, 3D printing could be both high end and low end, you know, for both levels of where people need it. I think that's, yeah, that, that sort of gives me hope. Yeah. What about a nano a lot, of, a lot of engineers and small companies, uh -huh. they came up with very creative approaches and ideas, like you say, to, 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 to manufacture, parts for safety goggles, uh, face masks, shields, and you know, uh, parts for other medical equipment needed. And 3D printing is very promising. And actually, for the first time in real time, 3D printing showed its, its huge power and how, how, how it can help the society and people in situations like this. Yeah. So, what about nanotechnology, which I had asked before, but what about that? How, how do you see it right now being very helpful? Yeah, that's, that's interesting to talk about. So when we look at the, 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 the coronavirus, uh, uh, we know that uh, engineers, scientists, and physicians yet don't know much about it. Mm -hmm and still a lot of people are trying to, to learn more and more about that. But at the same time, what we know about this virus is that it exists at, at nano level, at molecular level, and it operates, it operates at molecular level. Having said that, nanotechnology is very promising to, to handle diseases such as this. For example, Nanotechnology allow, allows us to have uh, tiniest and the most advanced sensors and actuators uh, to monitor our health indicators. Uh, and we already have a lot of handheld medical devices mm -hmm. that are used to monitor our vital signs such as yes. temperature, heart rhythm, blood sugar, blood pressure, mm -hmm. and oxygen saturations. <laughs> and these are vital signs. And uh, we already have a lot of sensors doing that. So another way is using nanorobots. Nanorobots uh, can be used inside our bodies to diagnose and treat diseases at molecular level. Okay. So that, 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 that's a very interesting approach to, to look at that. Another, another uh, way to that nanotechnology helps is um, making um, hu modeling human organs and micro nano devices uh, to study our bodies at molecular level. 
So when you, when you have organs modeled on micro and nano devices, you can study human organs at nano level for, for um, like creating approaches and solutions for prevention, diagnosis, and treating diseases at such a precise level that I just talked about. And this virus, it seems that its size is about 120 nanometers. So it's very good in the reach of nanotechnology. But are we in nanotechnology? Is it like here or is it like still coming? Like when we talk about nanotechnology, I know they're talking about maybe some things are already prepared to go to market. But and also would that only would that be possible for most people, given we talked earlier about affordability, about how expensive things are? Do you think it's near or is it gonna be? Yeah, so with the cost of sensors going down more and more, so because sensors and micro electromechanical systems and nano electromechanical systems play a great role in making this, these approaches possible. So with the price of these, these, these systems and nano devices and sensors going down, it's going to become more and more available to people, but at least for now, for now, we have a lot of med handheld medical devices that at least monitor monitor our health indicators. Another approach is actually using nanotechnology and uh, genome sequencing to to understand the root causes of disease, such as cancer and Alzheimer and heart yeah. problems. And we, when we understand the root causes of disease, uh, scientists and engineers are hoping to be able to switch off the root cause of this disease forever. Yeah, matter of fact, it's important that we mention that because, because of the um, pandemic, people are forgetting that there are other things that still exist. People are still pregnant and having difficult pregnancies. People are still having Alzheimer's. People are still having cancer. And so while we don't want to minimize the threat of the pandemic, just want to make sure people remember that many of us have loved ones who are still going through these other diseases. And you talk about Alzheimer's on a personal note. I mean, my family, my mother in particular, um, suffered from it. And I always was looking for, I wanted to engineer a way to be able to know how she was feeling because I, w I didn't know if she was in pain. There was no way for me to know what level of pain. So I'm waiting for them to engineer some sensor that can you know check her brain signal and say okay she's in so much level of pain she needs some pain medicine or something you know it sounds like a fantasy now but i'm hoping it will not be a fantasy you know in five years or as i as will exist in five years because they'll come up with a new medicine so let's talk about biotechnology i'm very interested in that because i think biotechnology is a good space where the lesser developed countries could play a role. What are you seeing with that? Yeah, for example, well, biotechnology is a broader, broader area, but this, 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 you know, um, it, it's a combination of, you know, of course, knowing about the human organs and systems in our body and using technology to, to actually to come up with, with great solutions that we can, we, can, we can improve the human health. But going back to, to the impact of this, for example, we talked about nanotechnology and uh, genome sequencing, and eventually, of course, people are hoping to do uh, gen, edit, gen editing so that you can, you can improve health and prevent diseases and all of that. Uh, so, like I said, biotechnology, for example, in bio, another trend in biotechnology is people are trying to regrow organs, regrow on, organs using bioprinting and stem cells to regrow organs such as liver, heart, kidney, and skin. So that, that's another, another trend that we are seeing. But uh, we, can, we can talk about this in more details, but biotechnology is, is broad, so we have to talk about a specific part of it. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I guess for me, as somebody who is concerned always about developing countries' access to health care, and knowing that many of the pieces of equipment that are engineered for use here in America are just way outside our Europe, are way outside affordability of, let's say, you know, a country like Ghana, 
or country like Barbados. And so at the same time, when I look at the, the, the healthcare remedies that are now being explored in terms of plants, one of, one of the things I find is that the universities in those poor countries are always missing equipment. So back to engineering, <laughs> they don't have the equipment or if they have the equipment, they don't have people to fix it. And here, here again, 3D printing might become important if every engineering school in, an, in, in, in a developing country, for example, was to be equipped with a good quality 3D printer, they might be able to repair all the other lab equipment that isn't working so they can get ahead. Um, so you said also about robots. What about robots and AI? How, how, how are you seeing that? Yeah, so, well, robots are very promising in healthcare system and medical system. For example, we already have surgical robots that can precisely operate operate at a very precise level. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to become more and more popular. Mm -hmm. So mm, autonomous surgery is also coming. So uh, this, this, is, this, is, this is the area that is very interesting. But for, for the current uh, crisis and problems, actually, uh, care robots are, are very interesting, uh, you know, system that people are using, you know, autonomous robots to to disinfect hospitals and care centers, you know, uh, medical equipment, beds, and all of those things that needs uh, to be disinfected, people are using autonomous robot and UV light to, to do this disinfection for, for this system. Also, me medical robots and care robots have been used to take uh, coronavirus testing so that you don't need to expose the medical professionals to to those people maybe have have they have this disease already so robots can do that easily and precisely and also people are using robots to deliver medical supplies and care care supplies uh, you know for for people that are isolated and for people that they need those things well you know Japan and South Korea have been using robots for a long time. Um, robots haven't really caught on in America um, as quickly at that level of use that they do in Japan, where you have elder care robots and patient care support robots and robots in museums and robots in the front of hospitals. Um, I think in large part because just the Number one, we have more people to employ here, right? And whereas Japan has really closed their employment. So, and the society in America is still very not comfortable with the concept of a robot in terms of a robot taking somebody's job, that's one thing. And I think, although I think this situation will see more people probably um, being open to some kind of robot AI figure, doing something, especially in the age of dangerous jobs. But I think in America, we're still gonna see a pushback in terms of the care, as in the personal care. But again, to the extent that this pandemic is like, a, let's say, hopefully not, but it could be a pre-sequel a pre to worse to come in the future, mm -hmm. we kind of have to be mentally prepared that we may have to socially get used to this idea of care no longer having a human touch in the same way that we'd have before. Um, yeah, so really, we think about healthcare engineering and, and society, we can then basically say that certainly in terms of healthcare, it's just one way in which engineers play a big role. So let's just wrap this up then, Hassan. Thank you so much for insight. It was very enlightening. And let's get ready to bring on our guest for today, who is Professor Bill Halal. Uh, so, Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Thank you. So for first guest, we will have Professor Bill Halal, who is a professor emeritus from the George Washington University and he is founder of the TechCast project. Hassan, why don't you introduce him? So our guest today is Dr. William Hallow. 
Dr. William is Professor Emeritus of Management, Technology and Innovation at George Washington University. He studied engineering, economics, and social sciences at Purdue University and University of California, Berkeley. His publications have appeared at notable journals such as Nature Biotechnology. Dr. William was an engineer on the um, Apollon program. He also worked with General Motors. Dr. William was a Silicon uh, Valley business manager. He serves on the advisory board of World Future Society. He is the founder of TechCast. Dr. William, hello and welcome to Engineering and Society. Hi, Asan. Good to be here with you. I'm glad that you could able to you you could join us today for this podcast. It's good to be here. Thanks. So, Dr. William, why not start with asking you, giving us a brief introduction about the TechCast project? Uh, I started TechCast about 20 years ago uh, when I introduced a course in emerging technologies. And one of the first things we did was start forecasting technologies. I had some graduate students and some colleagues help me. And uh, when we produced our first forecast, we were flooded with uh, interest, phone calls, emails, letters. And uh, that told me that we had something important here that people uh, needed to learn about uh, technology and when, when it was going to occur and that sort of thing. So we kept improving the system and, and now I think it is the best forecasting system in the world. I think that's fair to say. We won an award from, uh, 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 um, from uh, I'm sorry, I'm blocking on the name. But anyways, we won a number of awards, we cited by the National Academies, and we were featured with a full page in the Washington Post. So I, I think it's really been a marvelous experience. And the, the heart of the system is the use of collective intelligence as a methodology. And this is, I think, I think we do this very well. We start by uh, gathering all the information that we can find on the technology we're forecasting, which is very useful, of course. It, it brings a lot of clarity to the, uh, the technology, but it still leaves a great uncertainty. Uh, in fact, we find other forecasts and we look at those and there's lots of variation among the other forecasts. So there's always uncertainty. And that's where the experts come in. We have uh, more than 100 experts around the world. They look over the background information and then they give us estimates on key factors that we want to uh, forecast, like the time uh, when the, the technology will reach the next critical uh, adoption level. It could be uh, entering the, the market at zero uh, adoption level. It could be the 15% level where a technology takes off could be the 30% level where the technologies become mainstream. And so they give us those estimates. They also estimate the size of the economic market globally in billions of dollars. And they give us the confidence they have in their forecast. And then the system crunches the numbers and the forecasts are updated in real time. So the forecasts are constantly changing depending upon the background information that that we find and the experts' uh, judgments. Uh, that's uh, the system, basically. It's, I think, a very powerful system. So, Dr. Bill, um, when we think about this um, in the context of the grand engineering challenges and this idea of engineering tools of scientific discovery, especially now, engineering better medicines, especially now, lots of things have been floating out. Earlier, I was speaking to, um, to Hassan about, you know, things like, nanotechnology or um, robots, AI, etc. What are you seeing in terms of collective intelligence as you are um, deeming it for the TechCast project and how that might me help us to engineer opportunities to address this current challenge? Well, the, the space, this system is basically uh, can be used for almost anything. It can be used to make any important decision. It's basically a system for reducing uncertainty, providing answers to tough problems. And so in our case, we use it to forecast technologies. It could also be used to 
uh, evaluate different engineering projects to see which approach is more effective. For instance, say uh, replacing the human heart. Uh, there are two, three or four ways that that could be done. It could, you could uh, grow a, uh, a bioengineered uh, replacement, a living organ. You could manufacture a, a mechanical heart. You could uh, 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 augment certain parts of the heart that are failing. This would be a way to evaluate those different alternatives and decide which is more effective for different applications. So the basic method of collective intelligence can be used to solve any tough problem. Um, would you say that this is important, this collective intelligence, as you are looking at it, is more critical today than in the past? Well, I don't know if it's more critical today, but it's, it's, it's certainly needed because we're faced with such great uncertainty. Uh, that's what this is for. It's for reducing uncertainty. There will always be uh, some doubt, but this is a method for reducing uncertainty on any tough problem. And uh, we're flooded with all sorts of very difficult problems, the climate uh, uh, change problem. You know, which, which methods are most effective for uh, solving that problem? How would you get people to comply with climate change? Uh, all of these uh, uh, problems that we face today are fraught with uncertainty, and this is a method that could be used to uh, bring clarity to all of those problems. Yeah, so to me, this means that you help companies, society, and people to get prepared, basically, for what is, what is unknown today and look at trends and you know gathering data from different resources and come up with the best you know possible prediction so that people and companies and societies can get prepared for what's coming next so with that can you talk a little about how you collect the data and how basically you do engineering on collective intelligence uh, well, I'm just not sure what you're asking. Basically, what, how the system works. Well, I, I outlined it very simply, but I'll go into more detail. Uh, you, the, uh, getting the background data is essentially scanning. And you can scan any source of information that you like. Uh, the internet is, is wonderful for doing that. You could use journals, newspaper articles. You could interview people. You could go to conferences. There are all sorts of, of information that you could gather. So whatever method you use, you gather that information. And then uh, it takes a, a little art to organize it into trends. And you, uh, and you, you cluster the, the data that you find uh, into, into packets that look similar, have the same, they deal with the same subject. Then you identify that as a trend, you give it a name, and you might end up with a half dozen different trends. And uh, that's the framework of the problem. So that's how you frame the problem for the experts. You organize the, the data you find into trends that are driving the technology and trends that are opposing the technology, that are an obstacle to it, in the case of forecasting technologies. But whatever, whatever you're doing, you, you organize the data into trends or clusters of data. And you, so you frame the problem and you pose the question very concisely that you want answered. It might be which of these alternatives is most effective. And uh -huh. you give them a scale that they rate these alternatives on from say zero to 10. And then they enter estimates and you aggregate the data. So it's a very simple method, but it's very powerful, I think. Okay, great. So uh, as we know, engineering the tools for scientific discovery is one of the grand challenges in the 21st century. Uh, what does this mean to engineers in terms of opportunities to further improve people's life? Well, the technology revolution is changing the world. There's no question about that. We've seen just the beginnings of that. The smartphone alone is, I think, a miracle. The fact that we, uh, just in the last 10 years, have developed a device that we can carry around that has more computing power than mainframes used to have 10 or 20 years ago. Yeah, and we all uh, remember those days. <laughs> we all, unfortunately, we're all of an age where we remember those days, right? right? I mean, it's, it's such a remarkable device 
and you have video, audio, you can do almost anything on it, the GPS, uh, the navigation, you know, your calendar, everything. I mean, it's truly an amazing device. And it's provided all of the world's knowledge at the, at the, the touch of a fingertip for every individual on earth. Mm -hmm. That is a miracle, I think. That's an amazing thing. It would have been un inconceivable 20 years ago. So yeah. uh, there, there are, that's just one mm -hmm. example. There are hundreds of breakthroughs like the smartphone that are right around the corner or that are here now, almost here now. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And, and actually with AI coming and other converging technologies, you know, emerging to, to you know, these phone technology, digital twins, you know, 3D printing and, you know, that's and right. the AI, we, it, it's going to be very exponential, even more exponential than... On TechCast, we, we covered uh, 50 emerging technologies, 30 social trends and about 25 wild cards roughly a hundred uh, different forecasts that we would uh, keep uh, current. We would constantly update them. And those hundred forecasts, I think uh, they cover about 95% of the, the turbulence out there in the environment. Not everything, but I think they're the major, they, they are the major factors that you would need as a strategist to make decisions. You know, I'm thinking, Dr. Bill, as I'm just thinking out loud here, and I'm thinking about the COVID pandemic, which I know you've been writing a lot about collective intelligence to solve it. And what popped up in my head was it would be great if TechCast could be used to, say, bring together some of the engineering or pharmaceutical companies that are looking at different types of vaccine delivery or whatever, and run a kind of an experiment to see which ones could maybe emerge as the most efficient and affordable for societies. I mean, have you given any thought to that in terms of, I mean, talk about engineering, best, engineering better medicines. We have to look at it right now where people around the world are trying to find affordable ways to do this. What What's are your thoughts on that? Uh, you're exactly right. These methods could be used very effectively in uh, finding solutions to the COVID uh, 19 problem. You're exactly right. We didn't do that, but we did focus on the uh, the uh, global implications of the pandemic. The pandemic, I think, is just a, a warning, so to speak, of the other threats that are right around the corner. Uh, like there are going to be more pandemics. You can almost count on it because with all of the air travel, we have a unified world. And so a, a virus is going to spread unless its measures are taken to stop it. So you can almost count on more pandemics. We've had a half dozen in the last 10 or 15 years, and we're going to have more of them. Uh, but there's then climate change right around the corners. Climate change is starting to really become serious. Uh, Europe, uh, the Europeans have uh, a heat wave of more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit mm. for weeks. Australia had forest fires like they've never seen before. The polar ice caps are melting. We're oh. seeing droughts, heat waves. So you're going to see a lot of uh, damage from uh, climate change. And the, the, there's global recessions. Uh, the pandemic is, le is leaving in its wake a major recession. It could turn into a global depression, really. Oh. And there are just endless problems like that. Uh, we identify, uh, that is, I'm talking about myself and Mike Marion. We did a study a few years ago on the global mega crisis, we called it. We identified all the trends that are creating great threats. And we found about 17 major threats, uh -huh. like climate change and that sort of thing. Water shortage is, is another good example. Uh -huh. Then we also looked for the, the trends that are alleviating the problems, but we can only find four or five trends that are positive. So uh -huh. the bulk of the trends are negative. Yeah great threats uh -huh. and um, uh, we addressed that in our recent work at, on TechCast by using collective intelligence again. Uh, I gathered background information on all of these major threats uh -huh. and uh, uh, framed the problem online uh -huh. on, our, on our newsletter uh -huh. as to the, the mega crisis, the global mega crisis, described everything about the mega crisis uh -huh. background information, uh -huh. 
-hmm. And then I invited experts to give us their opinions mm -hmm. on this problem that I posed. Yeah. We got 12 different uh, forecasters, uh, yeah. forecasters, futurists, thought leaders, mm -hmm. intelligent people to look over this information. Mm -hmm. And they gave us their, their opinions in a short statement of yeah. 500 words or so. And mm -hmm. so this was another example of collective intelligence. And what we uh, learned is that uh, they almost all agree that the present global order is not sustainable hmm. under these conditions. Wow. So if, if civilization wants to survive under any reasonable conditions, there, we need to have a different global order, a different mindset, a different gotcha. global paradigm, a different set of global ethics or yes. something, a different way of thinking. Yes. The present way of thinking is not sustainable. That's the cause of the problem. And so a new form of thinking is needed. And we came up with five major principles for this new way of thinking uh -huh. that I call global consciousness. Now, we, I could be wrong, but <laughs> these 12 people and all the background information uh -huh. seem to agree that something like this is needed. And those five principles are, are very uh, basic, but they're very powerful. The first one is treat the earth and all of its life forms as sacred. Okay. I think that's absolutely essential. That's where we have to begin. Life on this planet is so unique. It's another miracle. Uh, SETI has been searching for intelligent life in the universe for almost 50 years. And we found no sign of intelligent life. Uh, there probably is life out there, but it's further away than we can, than we can reach it. But it, it demonstrates how remarkable planet Earth is. It's a miracle. This, this planet exists at all, and it has intelligence, and that we've come so far that we can do all of these things. So it's, it's a remarkable thing. I want to, um, to before you go on to number two, because um, I think number one itself is so dense. When we talk about treat Earth and all life forms as if it were sacred, yes. and we look at the role, let's say, of engineers, I think perhaps we may need to address then some how we teach engineering ethics to like young engineers yes. in terms of a more systems of systems thinking and do you think something like that should be like now required in all engineering disciplines in terms of the sustainability ethos what are your thoughts on that exactly right when i uh, studied engineering at purdue uh, many years ago there was no thought of the social and human implications none whatsoever that i recall but now I think it's becoming common. For instance, the field of, uh, of design, uh -huh. which is a form of engineering, uh, they, that's what they do. They look for all of the social and environmental implications and try to take those into account. And I think that's exactly right. That has to be done. Uh, I was part of a, uh, a wonderful strategic planning study at the American Society of Civil Engineering. Uh -huh. And uh, they tried to forecast uh, the different worlds that civil engineers would have to uh, create uh -huh. in the future. And they, they identified about six of them. One was a floating world, and they're working on that right now. Worlds that are constructed on, on, on seawater. Uh, and uh, there are five others. One is, a, I think, a polar world in, in the, uh, the Arctic. And I, I don't yeah. know what the others are. And all of them have profound... Uh, environmental constraints. So they are being forced to take the environment and social behavior and ethics into account when they do that. What is principle two? Pardon me? Principle two. You said there were five principles. Uh, uh, the second principle is, uh, 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 let's see, what is the second principle? Oh, manage the world or govern. Govern the world as a unified whole. I think all of these are absolutely essential if we want to have a sustainable society. We can't pretend that the, na the, na the nation state is the ultimate decider of global actions. That's just silly because we have a unified world, whether you like it or not. Economically and electronically, the world is united. All of these systems are global systems. And the pandemic brings that, makes that very clear. 
the pandemic is a global problem. It would be more easily solved if it were tackled as a, as a unified approach. And so we need some way to organize nations into a coordinated whole, uh, probably using the UN. The UN has gotten a lot of bad uh, uh, reputation in the last 20, 20 or so years, but that's because the nation states have not supported the UN. And that could change dramatically because it's, I think, more, uh, it's almost self-evident now that we are a unified uh, planet and we have to work together. Yeah, so basically based on what you are talking about, it seems that systems engineering and system thinking needs to be applied to all of this. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a very good approach to come up with an effective and efficient way to, to handle these things. So going back to our conversation about the rapid uh, pace of technological advancement that we are seeing and you just described it in different ways how do you see the rate of societal change as compared to this rapid uh, pace of technological advancement and what are some some immediate and main implication of this to society well it's a revolution it's a technology revolution and uh, in 10 years, the world will look very different. There's no doubt in my mind. Uh, Self-driving cars, artificial intelligence, uh, all of the things that you mentioned, the 50 technologies that we cover, the social trends, the wild cards, the world's gonna look very different. Uh, and dealing with these threats, the global mega crisis is going to require a dramatic change in global outlook, global systems. And I think in the next 10 years are going to be critical. Yes. So based on that, it seems with this rapid change of technology advancement, so it creates opportunity for people, but at the same time, it may, it may cause some issues for some people if they, go, if they don't keep up with the trends. So... It's going to be very difficult. That's absolutely true. It's, 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 a, it's a crisis of maturity. That's the way I see it. The, uh, the, the, the planet, the civilization, is being challenged to either grow up or, or disappear. We will not have a civilization as we know it if we don't change dramatically. It's like, like a teenage kid who graduates from high school. He thinks he knows everything, but he doesn't. And he can't cope in the world. And so uh, the pain gets, let me just finish this thought. And the pain of not being able to adjust keeps increasing until this child takes control of his life and <laughs> decides on a course of action and changes his life, grows up. And that's where we are as a civilization. Yep. We want to grow up, take responsibility for that's our behavior, right. and decide where we want to go and, and do it. So with this said, what is the best approach that people can take to stay relevant? And also, how TechCast can help people with this? Well, that's what these five principles are about. It's their, uh, a, a framework for thinking about the kind of future that we What's have. What's the third principle? What's the third one? The third one is economic. We recognize that markets are essential. Nobody, I think, wants to go back to planned economies like the Soviet Union did. So markets is, are essential, but markets can differ enormously. And the, the, the capitalist form of market system, where uh, profit is the, the only legitimate goal, really, that is no longer acceptable. And that is changing. The uh, 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 business roundtable in the United States within the last half year came out with a statement uh, uh, recognizing that shareholder supremacy, the focus on profit uh, mainly, is no longer adequate. And now they, uh, they uh, uh, propose that CEOs consider the, the interests of all stakeholders, employees, customers, business partners, uh, their investors, of course, and local communities. 
So, so I have a question though with Bib. So we say marketer central. Wouldn't you want to paraphrase it or put a word before markets to imply the shift? Because if we just say marketer and central, the default will be the capitalist market system is essential. And you're saying it can't be that. So are we saying now, do you want to like tighten that definition and say, blah, 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 markets are essential? Conscious here's, markets here's, or here's the way the principle is stated. The principle says manage markets to serve human and social needs or all stakeholder needs instead of profit alone that's the big change and that would transform economic systems from being capitalist in the sense of focusing on capital alone into being democratic where they serve the needs of society as a whole that would be a revolution that is a remarkable development and it's being taken very seriously uh, 180 ceos signed the business roundtable announcement so they're behind it and the uh, biggest investment company in the, in the world blackrock which is led by larry fink he came out and required all of the companies he owns to follow those that new uh that new set of principles of uh, stakeholder uh, collaboration so it's it's happening right now it's an amazing thing it, I, I never would have believed that it would happen but it's it's happening as we speak and it, it truly is revolutionary. And what about before we have, we have to go so much, I would like to hear four and five. By the way, I'm calling what you're calling democratic markets. I'm calling it either conscious capitalism or my latest one is Ubuntu economies. But that said, what is number four and number five? Well, well, before you go, we move to that. Let me correct you. You can't call it conscious capitalism because it would no longer be capitalism. It'd be a market system, but not capitalism. Okay. That's why I call it democratic enterprise. Yeah. It's still free enterprise, but it's not capitalism. It doesn't focus on capital alone. So then I stick with my or my new one, which is Ubuntu economics, which recognizes all people as interdependent with species. So that's my current word. <laughs> so number four is what? Number four is what? Um, four is uh, embrace diversity as an asset. Rather than being fearful of differences in cultures and people, it would be wonderful if we could see that these differences are good, that different people and different cultures are a source of knowledge and different ideas and innovation and energy, uh, so that these differences that divide the world are really totally unnecessary. And in fact, young people understand that. The students that, that I see at universities uh, intuitively behave this way they they value the different uh, differences among their colleagues they think it's great when they have uh, oriental students asian students black students uh, they, they they don't see a problem at all they don't see the, the racial differences and uh, sexual differences also they don't worry about homosexuality or any of those things so the young people understand this they are already global citizens they are behaving the way adults should behave now. Yeah, specifically millennials care a lot about you know yeah. their impact on society, and they always ask, "What's what's my impact? What what are you gonna do?" And I think that that's become more and more important among the young generation. The fifth principle is celebrate life. That's what this celebrate. is all about. That's a very good one. The purpose of all of this is to savor the miracle of life, to rejoice in it. And uh, the Olympics are, are a wonderful example of that. But we should, we need to do something like that as a continual everyday experience, perhaps online, uh, talking across cultures, across nations, across racial differences, and just to glory in the miracle of life that we are here on this planet. It, it, it's an amazing thing. It's a miracle, really, that we're here and that it has evolved so quickly in our lifetimes. I mean, in my lifetime, I've seen us move from an industrial society to a post-industrial society, service economies, to the information revolution and a knowledge uh, economy, a knowledge age, and now we are moving into an age of consciousness because AI is automating knowledge work. And so we're being forced to move beyond knowledge. That's the key phrase I use, beyond knowledge. We're moving into an age of consciousness. The fact that this would happen in my lifetime is amazing. 
absolutely amazing. And that means we have a responsibility to be true to this amazing experience that we have in our hands, the ability to change the world for the better. Right now, uh, the people who are living today, we have an enormous responsibility to do this and do it well. Yeah, I think you are writing a book actually on that topic, Beyond, Beyond knowledge. knowledge. So can you just like briefly talk about that? Is it talking about this, 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 this important uh, issue? Well, well, as I say, I think we have uh, entered an age of consciousness now. The most obvious example is the existence of what we today are calling the post-factual world, the post-factual era. Yeah. We have reached an era, an age now, where facts are not that important. Uh, half of the people don't agree with climate change. Another half don't agree with evolution. And, you know, President Trump, for instance, you know, makes things up as he goes along. Um, he's a master at shaping consciousness. He's a great example, he's a bad example, really, of what consciousness is about. He's creating a, a form of consciousness that's really not a very good form of consciousness, but it's consciousness. And so we are in a, an age of consciousness now. Consciousness is where everything starts, what we believe, what we value, yes. the, the ideas we have, because that's what motivates human behavior. And so we have, that's why, that's where we get this, crisis of global maturity. We have to develop a form of consciousness that is going to work, that's going to see us into the future, a form of global consciousness. So we're in an age of consciousness right now, and we are constantly changing consciousness. People using uh, psychedelic drugs, meditating, uh, doing yoga, uh, uh, running, you know, all, all sorts of things. People are shaping their own consciousness uh, every day, uh, that's to be uh, uh, celebrated. And the, the, the changing of institutions, like changing business into a democratic form of enterprise, that is a shift in consciousness. To embrace that, to make that real, we have to change the way we think about business. We can no longer think of business as simply uh, intended to make money. That's what is causing many of the problems today. We have to reconceptualize how we think about business how we think about government, how we think about education, religion, all of the institutions. That's what the book is about. Well, I think we've run out of time. It's a good place to end it. Um, your message was very powerful. Five mm -hmm. principles that we need to think about and um, really about the mind shift we have to make to grow up or become extinct. Hassan? Yeah, thank you, thank you. I think this was a great conversation. Uh, we greatly appreciate uh, Dr. William. You, you could join us. I think this was a great pleasure. And we look forward, hopefully, for your book to get out as soon as possible. I think that will be of great value to people and society. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Claire. I hope this was useful. Yes, um, and folks, if you've been listening and you enjoyed, please send feedback on Twitter to at Dr. Hassan Rashidi. Again, at Dr. Hassan, H-A-S-S-A-N-R-A-S-H-I-D-I, for your feedback. Thank you. Any closing words, Hassan, before I wrap us up? Anything else to say? This is the Engineering and Technology Podcast. <laughs> Great. So in Farsi, is Felan. That is goodbye for now. And remember, there are no laws of nature in opposition to an idea then what is deemed as impossible is most likely an engineering problem waiting to meet its solution. So until next time, Felan, goodbye for now. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.